Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I hope that you're well. It's today is Wednesday. It is the twenty. It's the first of March, and we're getting ready for Parshas Titzava, which is also Parsha Zachar. Special reading that we're going to have reading a maftir this week on Shabbos before Purim, and because we're the week before Purim, and and uh, Megillah Esther is just around the corner. I think I want to share today something involving Purim and Megillah Sester. Today is also the Shloshim of our dear friend, Mr. Alan Kuttner, passed away this past, a month ago. And we want to dedicate this morning, or the, rather this afternoon's Torah learning, as an aliyah for his neshama, for Yehuda Avram, ben Rav Yoshua, Zichrona Levracha. Maybe the Torah learning that we're going to participate in today be an aliyah for his neshama, and may HaKadosh Baruch Hu grant his neshama, his true comfort to his to Alan's loving family. Okay, what I want to share with you today, as I said, is related to Purim and Megillah Esther, and it's going to involve a line, or rather several words in the Megillah that caught my eye a number of years ago, and as I started to look and, and see what did our Mepharshim, what did our Rishonim, our early commentators, uh, what did they think about these words? What did they think about this line? I was startled because there's an incredible amount that can be learned here. So let's first just take a look in the Megillah itself and let's see just how many times this term and these words present themselves. So the first time you'll see this term and these words show up is in a Paragimel, the third chapter, the third parak of, of Esther. And in this parak, this is when Haman has started his plot. He has begun his, his plan, how he wants to eradicate all of Jewry in the Persian Empire. And we see the plan as it's written down. The Pasuk says as follows, Letters were sent by and through the hands of the runners. El kol they were sent out into all of the king's states or his provinces, Lashmid Laharog Ulaabed, to destroy, to slay, and to cause to perish as Kola Yudin, every last Jew, Minar came from young to old, Tap Hashim, little children and women beyond on one day. What was the day that this was supposed to happen? The Shloshasar Lachodashnem Asar Ruchodashadar. The slaughter was supposed to take place on the 13th of the month of Adar. Adar is the 12th month in the Jewish calendar. So on the 13th of Adar, that's when the slaughter was supposed to happen. That's when genocide against the Jewish people and throughout the Persian Empire was supposed to take place. And one last detail, the Pasuk tells us what else was in this letter. Not only were the Jews supposed to have been killed on the 13th of Adar, but also Ushlalam Lavoz. All of their possessions, all of their money, all of their resources, lavos, could be taken as spoils. Meaning, the letter that Haman sends out with the signature ring, the stamp of Achashverosh on it, is that uh, is is that not only can the Jews throughout the empire be killed, but all of their possessions can be sacked. Everything can be taken by the victors, by those who, who have gone to war against the Jewish people, they are entitled to all the possessions that they want. So that's that's the first time we see that expression, Nushlalam Lavoz. Now the words show up again later. When the decree is reversed, after Mordechai and Esther are at exposing Haman and showing Achashverosh what he had wanted to do, uh, Esther has shown herself to be a member of B'nai Yisrael. Achashverosh is, is uh, put back by Haman and what he wanted to accomplish here. So he tells them, I can't rescind his decree because the law in the Persian Empire was any decree that goes out with the king's signature on it cannot be rescinded. You can't retract it. However, what you can do is issue a new decree. And the new decree is allowing the Jews to stand up and fight their enemies. So let's see in Parakhas in chapter 8, what is the wording of this new decree? So let's look at a couple of psukim. So look in, um, in, Pasuk, in Pasuk Yud. I'm sorry, I just, went, I just went down to, yeah, Pasuk Yud. 
We're in Peraches, that's the eighth chapter, Pasuk Yod. So the new decrees are written in the name of Achashverosh, and they are signed with his signet ring. And these new letters are also sent out by the runners, Basusim and they are sent out on the, uh, the the fellows who are riding on horseback on the swift steeds, and these are these very fast horses that were used for this, and they were children of the Ramachim, and others, another very, excuse me, fast stallion. Yud Aleph, what did the letters say, the new letters? That King Achishverosh has granted permission to all the Jews that are found in any city throughout the empire, to gather, to stand up to protect themselves, that they can stand up and fight, and they could kill, and they could destroy the forces of any people that stand up against them, that try to assault them, that are threatening them. Tafinashim, whether that's little ones to women, Ushlalam Lavoz, and they are allowed to take the spoils. They are allowed to sack them, meaning the original decree was that every last Jew is to be killed. And those who oppress them, those who kill them, they're allowed to steal all their belongings. Nothing has to go to the state. Everything can be taken by the uh, by the the marauding forces who would annihilate, seek to annihilate the Jews. Now, when the second decree is issued that the Jews have the right to stand up and beat their enemies, now that very same privilege, Ushlalom Lavoz, is given to Am Yisrael, is given to the Jews, that not only are they allowed to stand up and fight and kill their enemies, but they are also allowed to take their enemies' possessions. Those same words, Ushlalom Lavoz. Yud Beis, uh, the next Pasuk, 12, And again, what's the day that the Jews are going to be able to stand up and fight all their enemies? It's going to be on the 13th of the 12th month, the 13th day of the 12th month, that's the month of Adar. So that very same day that was supposed to be the day of slaughter for the Jews and the day that the Jews, all their possessions would be Shlalam Lavoz, that the enemy would be able to take uh, possession of all of their all of their uh, items. That very same day, the Jews have now been granted permission to stand up, fight their enemies, slay their enemies, ushlalom lavoz on them, and now they have permission to take the possessions of all of their enemies. So the rights have been given, but how does it actually play itself out? Comes the thirteenth of Adar. What actually happens? So in the next parak, it's chapter nine in parak Tess, we find as follows. The Pasuk tells us that the fighting takes place and the Jews did in fact stand up and slay their enemies. So let's see what happens. Pasuk A, 5, And the Jews smote all their enemies with the sword and they slaughtered them and brought them to destruction. And they did against their enemies exactly whatever it was they wanted to do, meaning they were free to fight them. Vav Shushana Bira in the capital city of Shushan alone, Hargua Yudim Vabed Khamesh Meosish. On that first day of the fighting, on the 13th of Adar, they killed 500 of their enemies. A little bit later, Pasuk Yud. What happened to the fact that the Jews were given two rights to stand up and kill their enemies and also take their belongings? So let's see. Pasuk Yud tells us what did they do about that? Yud, Aseris Bene Amman Ben Amdasat Sarah Yudim Haragu that in the city of Shushan, where they killed 500 of their enemies, they also killed the 10 sons of Haman. Even though it said, even though it said that they were allowed to sack all their possessions and the Jews would be allowed to take all the possessions of their enemies who they slayed, the Pasuk makes a point of saying, and that 13th of Adar, when they fought in Shushan, they did not take anything, any of the spoils of war. They did not take a thing. A little later in that parak, Tesvav, 15. It says, All the Jews who were in Shushan stood up. They fought for a second day, in the month of Adar. So they first started fighting on the 13th. They fought again on the 14th. They are Gubi Shushan Shlosh Meosish. And then on the second day of fighting, they killed another 300 of their enemies. And again, 
the Megillah makes a point of emphasizing that the Jews did not take any of the possessions of their slave enemies, even though they were given their rights. They did not take a thing. Next, Pasuk Tazayin, Ushara Yudim Well, what happened throughout the rest of the Persian Empire? All the Jews gathered and they stood up to fight for their lives. And that finally allowed them to have rest from their enemies. And they were able to slay of their enemies. 75,000. 75,000 of their enemies throughout the Persian Empire. Again, three times we just saw that, that they did not take a thing of the spoils. They did not take a iota. They did not take a dime from the enemies that they slayed. So we see that three times in that parak. So I just want to point out that when I started noticing this several years ago, and it just struck me as so odd, is that first they're told, Ushlalam Lavoz. The first time we see Shlalam Lavoz is that the enemies of the Yudim, the enemies of the Jews, are given permission by Achashverosh. They're told, that you have full authority on the 13th day of Adar to attack the Jews, Ushlalav Lavoz. You're allowed to take all their possessions. And what we're told is, in Paraches, in the 8th chapter, after Mordechai and Esther are successful in exposing Haman, and they get Haman hanged, and they have to issue a new decree, the new decree gives the Jews the right to stand up and fight on the 13th of Adar, Ushlalav Lavoz. And it gives the Jews the right to plunder their enemies. But then three times in Paraches, when we're told just what was the body count, just how effective the, the Jews were in finding their enemies and killing their enemies, we're told three times that despite the fact that they had permission to plunder them, despite the fact that they had been granted authority of Ushlalam Lavoz to take their possessions of their enemies, three times it tells us, Uba Biza lo yadam. In the capital city of Shushan, on both days of the fighting, the Jews decided we're not taking a dime. And throughout the Persian Empire on the 13th day of Adar, all the Jews unanimously decided we're not taking a dime from our enemies despite having killed 75,000 of them and given the full authority to take whatever they wanted. The Jews did not touch a dime of the, of the plunder despite the fact they were entitled to it. So what's going on here? Why was it so important that Mordechai and Esther, when they issued that second decree, why was it so important that they give B'nai Yisrael the right to take the, the biza, the spoils of their enemy. And if it was important, why does the Megillah tell us three times that despite being given permission to take it, they absolutely unanimous, unanimously decided they're not going to take it. So how do we understand this? So I want to share with you a couple of views from our Rishonim. We're first going to look at Rabbeinu Bachia. Rabbeinu Bachia, as we know, is one of our great Rishonim, one of our early commentators in the Torah. And we know that he was from the great uh, Rabboni Sfarad, the great sages of Spain. And Rabbeinu Bachya, his, his parish is an absolute classic on the Torah. Let's take a look at where this is. Rabbeinu Bachya, where we, we actually find Rabbeinu Bachya here, this is in Shmos. It's in Shmos. It's the end of Parshas B'Shalach. When we read about, when we read about uh, Amalek having attacked the Ne Yisrael, we're told, that there's going to be this war after we were victorious in that first war against Amalek, we're told that uh, our mission in the, in the end times, in the times of Mashiach, is going to be to go against, to war against Amalek and to totally eradicate them. So let's take a look at Rabbeinu Bachya. This is from a larger comment of his, but we're just focusing on this. On the plain literal understanding of this mitzvah that Bnei Israel is given, to destroy Amalek in the in the times of Mashiach. So he's going to explain something here. He says as follows. Rabbeinu Bachia says, what does it mean that the hand of God uh, against the seed of God? The, the, so what does that mean? God is making every king who's going to rule over B'nai Israel take an oath. So Hashem, what does it mean? Kiyar al keska? That means anyone who's going to sit on kisei amalchus, any Jewish king who's going to sit on a royal throne, has to take an oath with God that they will go to war against the Malik because this is God's fight against the Malik. Bear, what is what does that mean? Yamilchamava shalol, meaning that the war and all the spoils hakolia asr behana. 
everything will be Asr Bana, we are not allowed to benefit from it. Meaning when Bnei Israel does go to war against Amalek, we're not allowed to enrich ourselves from this and take the spoils. All of the spoils belong to God, so to say, but do not belong to mankind. We cannot enrich ourselves from this. And because of this, that's why Shaul HaMelech was punished. Because when Shaul HaMelech, the first king of Israel, of Israel, when he did go to war against Amalek, he saved all the animals. So that's in violation of this. What did it mean, kiyad al keska? That we're supposed to take an oath. Every Malch is supposed to take an oath to go to war, God's war against Amalek, and not supposed to enrich themselves about this. It's asr bana. It's forbidden to have benefit from it. And Shaul, by saving the animals, was violating that. That's why Shaul was deserving of punishment. Midoro shal Shaul adoro shal Mordechai, and from the generation of Shaul, which was the first time that Bnei Israel was able to go to war against the Amalek until the generation of Mordechai, which we're going to read about in the in the Megillah. Now remember, Mordechai was from Shevet Binyamin. He was Ishimini. He's a descendant of Shaul HaMelech. And Haman was Haman HaAgagi, the Agagite. He was a descendant of Agag, who was the king of Amalek. So what you're seeing play itself out hundreds and hundreds of years later, after the initial battle between Shaul and Agag, you have this fight taking place from the forces of Mordechai against the forces of Haman. Again, it's Klai Yisrael once again against Amalek, being led by an Ishimini, by a descendant of Shaul. So he says, from the generation of Shaul until the generation of Mordechai, this was true. Mordechai knows that his, his great-great-grandfather Shaul was punished so terribly because he enriched himself when he fought against Amalek. And it was measure for measure. God said that my throne can only be complete when vengeance is taken against Amalek. And Shaul, by leaving the animals of Amalek alive, he was not being careful to take God's vengeance. Therefore, he was punished that he lost everything. He lost the kise, he lost the malucha, he lost the kingship. He lo nishar lo shem acharav, and he lost all his descendants. He lost all of his immediate family. Alanerag hu son benoimo. He and his beloved son Yonasan and others in his immediate following, they were killed in in battle. Enough al kise malchuso, and he lost his his throne of kingship. Now he says mipnei zanizar Mordechai bedavar. That's why Mordechai was so careful. Shelo leanos mishalol haman. He was so careful that when Bnei Israel went to war against the Amalekim, against Haman and all of his cohorts, and they killed 75,000 throughout the empire, and then all those that they killed within Shushan itself, that's why it says, he knows they're all Mizar Amalek, they're all from the seeds of Amalek. That's why it says, That's why it says so many times that they were so careful not to take any of the plunder. That when the Megillah writes about the downfall of Haman, it says, It says three times that Bnei Yisrael was Machmed. They were extremely, extremely cautious not to take any of the plunder. Because the Torah said, I want you to eradicate the memory of Amalek. And if we're going to take their plunder, we're not eradicating their memory. And so too, in the future war that will eventually take place between Bnei Yisrael and Amalek, all of the plunder, all of the spoils, it all goes to God. Because it says, It says, so he brings down from the Nevi'im that says that everything will be, everything will, will go to God. So Rabbeinu Bachia, how he's understanding this is as follows. He's saying, if you would ask, why does our Megillah tell us three times, Ubabiza lo sholcho es yadam? Simple. Mordechai is a descendant of Shaul, and he knows that Shaul failed terribly when he went to war against Agag, the king of Amalek. Why? Because he allowed some of the riches to remain. He allowed their animals to remain alive. And by doing that, he was going against God's will. So Mordechai knows this is his chance to get it right. So the chance to get it right now, after so many generations, is now Bnei Yisrael is going to war against Amalek. We're going to do it right this time. Shaul, his great, great, great Zayda, didn't do it right. So now Mordechai says, we're going to correct that. There's going to be a tikkun. We're going to correct 
what went wrong so many centuries ago. So they made it clear no one should take a dime because we have to be absolutely careful that this is a war of Hashem against Amalek. This isn't about enriching ourselves. And Shaul violated that. That's why he was punished. We're going to do it right this time. We're going to make sure that this is corrected. And therefore, that's why we, no one is going to take anything. So that's how Rabbeinu Bachia ex explains this. And that's how he understands this. That part and parcel of the Muhammad, of the battle against Amalek is to eradicate their memory. By, how do we eradicate the memory? There can't be anything left over, no material wealth from them. So the only way to do that is to, the, the money all has to be destroyed. It has to be clear that this was this was a battle uh, about taking vengeance from God, not about enriching ourselves. Shaul failed in that regard. Mordechai made sure we're not going to make that mistake a second time. So they must have issued a decree, made it clear to everyone, Babizalo So that's how Rabbeinu Bachi understands this. And that's a beautiful explanation. One thing Rabbeinu Bachia does not deal with, at least here, is, okay, so if it's so crucial as to the fact that Bnei Yisrael should not take any of the plunder, why in Perechas, in the eighth chapter, when, Ham, when Mordechai and Esther, after successfully deposing Haman, and now they send out letters, why did they grant Bnei Yisrael permission? It says, if you remember, if you look back on page two, it says, actually, that's on page one. It says in Parachas, in chapter eight, it says that when they issued the letter saying Bnei Israel are allowed to stand up and fight their enemies on the 13th of Adar, it says, Ushlalam Lavoz, you're allowed to take all of, you're allowed to plunder their possessions. So Rabbeinu Bachia doesn't deal with this. Rabbeinu Bachia did not deal with the fact that he gave a very good reason and understanding why the Megillah emphasizes three times in the ninth chapter, Uba Bizolo Shalchus Yadam that they did not enrich themselves at all because this was a chance to finally correct the mistake that Shaul made. So, okay, Rabbeinu Bachi is very clear about that. What he does not lend, what he does not uh, offer us insight on, at least not here, he doesn't tell us, okay, I get it. So if it's so bad, if they're not allowed to enrich themselves, if they're not allowed to take anything from the Amalekim, so why did Mordechai and Esther, in the letter that they sent, why did Mordechai and Esther say, Ushlalam Lavoz, that they're allowed to take possessions. So Rabbeinu Bachia, as great as his commentary is, and I love what he added here, he doesn't help us with this one detail. So I want to share with you the comment from one, comments of one of our other Rishonim. Ralbag, Rav Levi ben Gershon, we've quoted him a lot. Sometimes in Latin, he's known as Gersonides, which is this Latin for son of Gershon. Because again, Rav Levi ben Gershon, that's his acronym. Ralbag is Rav Levi ben Gershon. So his father's name was Gershon. So in Latin, that's Gersonides. Same way Maimonides is Latin for son of Maimon. So this is Gersonides is Latin for son of Gershon. So we're going to take a look at, 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 at Ralbag. And what Ralbag is going to do is he's going to address both these points. He's first of all going to tell us uh, why is it that B'nai Yisrael did not take a dime for a different reason than what Rabbeinu Bachia said. And then he's also going to deal with, okay, once I explain why they didn't take a dime, so then why did Mordechai and Esther authorize him to do so? So we're going to see, we're going to see what he does here. And I think you're going to be fascinated by the theory that Rabag puts forward. So what's unique about Rabag, I just want to introduce this before we look at him inside. What's unique about Rabag and his parish, his commentary to Tanakh, is that aside from offering the running commentary, like all the Rishonim do, he also has a section of his Toelios. Toelios are, what are the practical benefits? What are the takeaway lessons that we could get from all these, from every episode in Tanakh. So sometimes it'll be after every parak, and sometimes it might, might be after a couple of prakim. He'll say, okay, we've just concluded a sizable chunk in Tanakh. Could have been somewhere in the Parsha, could have been in Nivim, it could have been Suvim. Now let's go through what are the takeaway lessons. Again, sometimes it's just after one parak, sometimes it could be after many prakim. So you gotta you gotta hunt them down in the in where, where you have your rabads. So on Megillah Sester, he has. Um, dozens of toelios. He has do dozens of takeaway lessons. And I want to start here. Let's look at number 49, Memtes. He says something amazing. He says, that toelos ha Memtes, what's the 49th takeaway lesson that we could learn from Megillah's Esther? Lo it's to teach us, even though B'nai Yisrael were given permission, as you saw in Paraches in chapter 8, they were given permission to plunder 
the possessions of their enemies who they would kill on the 13th of Adar. Every Jewish community, no matter where they were in the Persian Empire, they all came to the same unanimous understanding. They had seicha, they had intuition, and they realized on their own, even though we were given permission to do this, we're going to pass up that opportunity. It's not a good idea. They all decided, no matter how much we might need the funds, no matter how much our shuls and yeshivas need to pay off our debts, no matter how much I need a new pair of shoes, we're not going to plunder anything from our enemies, even though we were given permission to do so. Why? That was the proper thing to do, not to take a dime. We don't want the world to think about us. That, you know why we went to war against the Amalekim? You know why we struck out and we killed 75,000 uh, throughout the Persian Empire? You know why in Shushan alone, why is it that we killed uh, uh, 300 and then all of the, the sons of Haman? Why did we do that? It was just for the money. There was no other reason. We could have all the, the, the theories in the world. We could have a great explanation of why we went to war against our enemies. But as soon as our enemies, as soon as our haters see that we profited from it, as soon as they saw we made a buck, all the other reasons go out the window and they'll say, oh, you know why the Jews did this? They were out for the money. Now, to me, this is incredible on many levels, is that number one, for close to a year, the original plot of Haman happens in the month of Nisan. And for close to a year, because Adar is not till almost 12 months later. So for close to a year, there have been signs, billboards hanging throughout the Persian Empire that say, get ready for the 13th of Adar, which is close to a year away. And on that day, because the letters went out, you can kill and slaughter all the Jews around Ushlalom Lavoz, and you could take all of their possessions. After dealing with this for and seeing this advertised, for so long, and knowing that that this is what the warnings that were out there, so it, it, people have close to a year to think about this, and now if the Jews do rise up on the 13th day of Adar and strike out against their enemies, won't it be clear, absolutely, abundantly clear to everybody that the reason why the Jews struck against their enemies was this was a preemptive strike. It was self-defense. Their enemies had been gearing up to kill them. The reason why the Jews struck against them was an act of self-preservation. Isn't that abundantly clear? Why would anyone say they did this for the money? I think it's very clear. The answer is once money's involved, no matter how much someone says it's not about the money, once money's involved and someone seems to have profited, everybody's going to think the reason this was done was for the money. It makes no difference how abundantly clear it might seem to be why everyone went to war. That the reason they went to war was self-preservation, was survival. They were in an existential crisis. That might be very clear to all of us, but as soon as money is on the table, that's an option that people could ascribe, give a reason to this for, then the world at large is going to say it was about the money. And because that's the way the world's going to react, Klal Yisrael, the Jewish people, they have to behave accordingly. So what did they all agree upon unanimously? Even though we were given permission, even though we were given permission to take their money, three times the Megillah emphasizes, we are not going to take a dime because we realize if we take a dime, then everything, all the defenses that we might put up about the reason we went to war, it was self-preservation, it was survival, all that. It's going to go out the window because the world at large is going to say you went to war because you wanted to enrich yourselves. So to make certain that there would be no confusion, no misunderstanding about what we did, there was a unanimous decision. To me, this is incredible because I, I think what, what this shows is that when people have a bias, when people have a bias, it makes no difference how clear the evidence must be out there as to helping us get to the bottom of the reason, helping us get to the, the nakuda, the real principle of the matter. If there's a bias out there that people want to say, okay, it was about the money, that's the conclusion they're going to reach, no matter how compelling the evidence may be in the other direction. And that's, and that's what happens here. He's telling us that's the human mindset. The human mindset is, <clears throat> if, we, if we have room to accuse another person of acting 
for the money, that's the way that's that's the accusation that's going to be made. No, regardless of how obvious it may seem to be that we acted for completely different reasons. That's 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 the mindset here. And because that's the mindset, we had to change our course of action and behave accordingly. So despite the fact we were granted permission to take the visa, to take the plunder, but Israel unanimously decides we're not going to do it because we don't want any erroneous conclusions. We don't want anyone to, to make a mistake of thinking the reason we went to war was about the money. This had nothing to do with the money. So now the question is, so if B'nai Yisrael is going to unanimously decide that they're not going to take a dime, why did Mordechai and Esther give them permission to do so? Why did the letters say, uh, that when they were given permission to fight their enemies on the 13th of Adar, that they were also given permission to plunder them? Why were they given that permission if it's not a smart thing to do? So look at this last piece in the Rabag, the last part there. I have it underlined, halfway through, however, even though Mordechai and Esther know it's not a good idea to take the money. All of the Israel knows it's not a good idea to take the money. Nonetheless, Mordechai and Esther decide the right thing to do is to at least give them the permission. Why? Let's say, even though the rest, all of Jewry is going to decide we're not taking a dime. But let's say something doesn't end up accounted for. The, all the jury decides we're not taking a dime. It, it'll go to the king. We don't want it. It's going to Achashverosh, it's his treasuries. But let's say something gets lost somewhere along the lines. I don't know. It may not have even been one of the Jewish soldiers. It could have been anyone. Someone who was bringing something to the treasury, skimmed something off the top. And now the numbers don't add up. So now it's going to come out that it, people will make the accusation, B'nai Yisrael stole it. So what did Mordechai and Esther do very wisely? In their decree saying that you're allowed to stand up and beat up on your enemies and kill your enemies, they put in there, Ushlalam Lavoz, you're also allowed to take their money. Therefore, in the event something doesn't make its way to the king's treasury, even though B'nai Israel weren't to blame for it, let's say it was one of the Persian uh, uh, cab drivers who took something. Nonetheless, the king can't be upset about it because the decree was Ushlalam Lavoz, that they were allowed to take the plunder. So if something's missing, okay, chalk it up to Ushlalam Lavoz. Hello, T Rex. And then he points out again, coming back to this, look at that, even in the king's capital of Shushan, nobody took anything. So the way the Rabbag is understanding this is beautiful. It fits on both parts. Why did Mordechai and Esther say Shlalam Lavoz when they wrote the decree? That's because they were trying to protect Klai Yisrael. We don't think it's a good idea for any Jews to take any money. Nonetheless, we're putting in there a clause of Shlala Lavo saying they are allowed to take the money. Just in the event something doesn't make it to the king, the king can't have any complaints and saying, wow, someone, someone took possessions that should have gone to the treasury. What do you mean? The decree said of Shlala Lavo, that it was a lot of, to the victor goes the spoils. But why did everyone decide Uba Bizala Shalchuas Yadam? Because even though that right was given to them and it was given to them to protect them, Nonetheless, they understand it's not smart to act upon it. They're sophisticated to, enough to understand, even though we were given that right, just because it was given to us doesn't mean we should act on it. Because if we act on it, then all of our uh, uh, explanation as to why we went to war, it's going to all go out the window. Everywhere, the world at large is going to say about us. All the headlines are going to be, the Jews killed 75,000 Persians, aside from what they did in Shushan, another 300. They killed all those Persians. Why? Because they wanted their money. And that's how the that's how the media is going to report it. Whereas if we don't take any money, it'll get reported for what it was. The Jews killed 75,000 of their enemies who were threatening their lives. So that's how they understood it. They understood the mentality of their enemies. They understood the mentality of the world at large. That if we give them a Pesach, if we even give them an entranceway, an, an opening to make such an accusation, everything's going to go out the window. So we're not taking a dime, despite the fact that we were justified in taking that money, despite the fact it was given, to, it was granted to us by royal decree. And despite the fact we might need the money, nonetheless, it's not worth it. We're not going to take it. That's what Klai Yisrael decided. But at the same token, Mordechai and Esther said, we're going to grant them that right to protect them just in the event some of that money doesn't make its way to the treasury. So there, there's so many lessons here, both in the way the world perceives 
uh, actions and human tendency is if you could ever ascribe it to the money, that's what they will ascribe it to. And by the way, I don't think this is just anti-Semitism. We see this all the time. You know, you, you look at every time that there's accusations being made, if there's ever a Pesach, there's ever an opening to say, okay, the person, what was motivating all this? What does everyone want to say? Follow the money, follow the money, follow the money. That's not anti-Semitism. That's everything. If you want to explain any uh, uh, questionable action, Follow the money, and that'll help you understand and send everything. If you can't find any money trail, whoa, now maybe there was something altruistic that took place here. So that's what Kali Yisrael understood, and that's why they acted. But Mordechai and Esther also wanted to protect them, and therefore they put in the clause, Ushlam Lavoz, that there's that there to the victor goes to spoils just in this way in the event something doesn't make its way to the treasury they didn't commit a crime because to the victor goes to spoils but again Kleiser was sophisticated enough to realize that just because we're being allowed to doesn't mean we should just because it's mutter just because it's permissible doesn't mean it's wise and that's that's what happens here so I think there's so many so many lessons from this rabag and 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 in so many different ways there. I want to show you how this Rabag is consistent, by the way, because as we said from Rabbeinu Bachia, we said that uh, Mordechai was not the first Ishi Mini, was not the first one from Binyamin to lead Bnei Israel in war against Amalek. His ancestor Shaul did just that, and he failed in that regard, according to Rabbeinu Bachia, because he enriched himself, or at least he sought to, by saving those animals, even if he was saying he was going to bring them back for the base Hamikdash to bring his Karbanos. Nonetheless, it went against the Ratzon, it went against God's will, and uh, God wanted the memory to be totally eradicated, and Shaul went against it. So, so what do we see? Look how Ralbag learns this. Ralbag says, this is in Shmuel Aleph, this is where the battle with Shaul and Amalek takes place. So look at what Ralbag does over here. What he says, what's the theory What's what's the understanding? What's perhaps the rationale why God wants absolutely for Amalek to be destroyed, even all their possessions, their animals? Shalom Yanu Yisrael Klam and that the Jewish people should not benefit from any of their possessions. Lahair, to make it very clear, Shakavana Elokis Haisa Bazel Lokichas Hanakama Mimasha Asa Amalek Li Yisrael Bader Ksaisa Mitzrayim. The only reason why God wants us to fight Amalek is to take God's vengeance against what they did to us on our way out of Egypt. Asher zanavam kolenach shalim achareim, they attacked the, the caboose, they attacked everyone who was moving slow. Laman yiru abayim ma'asos kadavar razeh. And God wanted to make it very clear, the only reason we're going to war against Amalek is because what they did to us when we left Egypt, and now nobody else, no other nation in the world should think about attacking Bnei Israel. God wants to make it extremely clear that when he sends the Jewish people against the, to go to war against Amalek, this is not a case where we're looking to enrich ourselves. It's not to the victor goes the spoils. That's not why we're fighting them. But now when the Jewish people under the leadership of Shaul did extend their hands and did take some of the spoils, Heru, they showed Kiloi Sakavras and Bazel and Akama. They showed that the, their intent on going to war against Amalek, this was not about taking vengeance for God. Aklo Alasma, they were just trying to benefit themselves. Bazel Haya Hepach Kavana Salokis. And this is against, uh, this is opposite from God's will. The Yidme Shalazosa Siba Beena Nishmuri Israel, be me Mordechai Vesser, Mishlach Yadam, be Zasai Vayam. So he says, this is why. Mordechai and his generation was so careful not to take any of the spoils when they fought their enemies in the Purim story. Show you Amalek, their enemies were from Amalek. And that's why the Miguel emphasizes three times that Bnei Yisrael never extended their hands to take any of the spoils from their defeated enemies. So Rabag's being consistent. Rabag is saying consistently, he's saying is that, is that it, it'll get lost. No one is going to understand the real reason why Bnei Yisrael were going to war against Amalek. In the days of Shmuel, uh, of Shaul, rather, they won't understand that the reason was because this is Nakama, this is vengeance, because of the fact that Amalek uh, attacked our people when we left Egypt. That'll get totally lost if, if we enrich ourselves because everyone's going to say, follow the money. And in the days of Mordechai also, the message will get lost that we were doing this out of self-defense, self-preservation. Even though that seems so obvious, it'll get lost because everyone's reaction will be follow the money. 
So, so that's human reaction. Human tendency is with our, our first gut reaction when we're trying to make sense of a questionable scenario is to say, follow the money. No matter how obvious other answers seem to be, follow the money is our instinctive, uh, instinctive impulse. And therefore, because that's human tendency to say, follow the money, Hashem designed it this way, that when we go to war against Amalek, be very careful not to do anything that could leave an impression that this was about the money. That's why we say hands off the Amaleki merchandise. Don't touch it. Why? Because that's, again, in God's picture, it's got to be very clear when we go to war against the Amalek why we're doing this. In the days of Shaul, we used to take vengeance because Amalek attacked us. In the days of Mordechai, it was self-defense. As soon as we get involved with money, that's going to uh, compel people to say, follow the money. That's human tendency. Hashem says, I know that's human tendency. B'nai Yisrael understood that was human tendency. And that's why they said, we're not doing it. We saw the mistake, what happened up in the days of Shaul. We're not going to do it in the days of Mordechai. Ah, so then why did Mordechai and Esther give them permission? That was only to cover their tracks in the event some money didn't end up in the palace. I want to just conclude with sharing with you some something that's awesome. I chanced on this a number of years ago. And it, it's, it does not get nearly the amount of coverage that it should. One of our great halachic farm at the time of the Bali Tosvos was called the Smag. Smag stood for Sefer Mitzvah's Gadol. It was written by Rav Moshe ben Yaakov of Kutsi, and he was living in France. He was one of the Bali Tosvos. And he has a fascinating story. He writes in the Akdama in the preface to this that basically he took it, he was one of the few Jews who uh, left Ashkenaz to go find communities of Sephardim, communities of Spanish Jews who had very quickly uh, fallen into assimilation. Again, remember this is before 1492 when he lived. So he actually went into Spain, into, into Jewish communities, and he was a traveling preacher, you might say, that he was going all over Spain and trying to uh, uh, almost run these revival meetings where he was trying to get Jews to start being Shomer Torah and Mitzvahs again because they were so deeply assimilated. And he writes, by the way, some communities had completely abandoned uh, mezuzahs and tefillin, and he encouraged them. He writes this. I, I've seen it where, where he writes about the mitzvah of tefillin and mezuzahs, that he personally is responsible for bringing back the mitzvah of tefillin and mezuzahs because he, he preached to them over there. Well, there was another big message that he preached to B'nai Yisrael in his time. And here it is. Look at this. This is under Hashavah Saveda, where he's talking about returning lost objects. And there is a lot of halachic uh, leeway. I don't want to say leeway. There's a lot of halachic differentiations that exist between many of the mitzvahs of Bein Adam Lechaver, our interpersonal relationships, how we have to treat our family members versus non-family members. Obviously, family members get treated better than non-family members, and that also applies to our people, is that we treat members of our extended family, B'nai Yisrael, on a different level, and we treat the world at large. Even though we're all tied to the brotherhood of man, nonetheless, there's a different level of, expect of expectation when we're dealing with family, and it, that extends to our that that applies to our extended family as well. So sometimes over the years, and you may have heard this, that people might say, therefore, uh, someone might say, I, I could steal from someone who's not Jewish because I don't have that responsibility. That's absolutely not true. Someone might say, I don't have a mitzvah of Ashavah Saveda, of returning the lost object to someone who's not Jewish. So this is what the, the smog is going on here. In the mitzvah of Ashavah Saveda, he says as follows, Kfar Darashti, Legalos Yerushalayim, Asher Farad. I am I'm saying publicly that I preached many times, I gave many drushas to the exiles of Jerusalem that are in Spain, Ulishar Golios Edom, and the other exiled Jewish communities throughout Edom, throughout uh, Rome, which literally means throughout Europe, Ashkenaz, Kiata, that now, Shearicha Golos Yosr Midai, now that our exile is going on much longer than it's supposed to. Yeshli Yisrael Avdil Mehevli Olam, it's time for the Jewish people to separate ourselves from the nonsense of this world. Lechos Bechos Moshal Kodesh Parchushu Emes. We have to separate ourselves from shady characters and we have to become the paradigms of honesty, truth, integrity. And to abhor any type of falsehood. To Jew, to Gentile, it makes no difference who we're dealing with. We have to be the paradigms of honesty. And we can't fool any of our non-Jewish countrymen, no matter even if they're illiterate, and it could have been people who wanted to take advantage of them. You're not allowed to, to fool them, to profit from, from getting, that, that's thievery. And 
and we have to sanctify ourselves even in areas where halacha might say we're allowed to act differently towards a non-Jew. We Halacha might say that we don't have to correct a business mistake that they made. Shenemar, because what does the Pasuk say in the Navi Tzifanya? Sheiris Yisrael lo yasu avla. Is that the remnants of Israel will not do anything which is dishonest. Lo yidabru kazav, and we won't speak in any crooked fashion. Lo yimza b'fiyam lo shantarmis, and will not be found in our tongues, in our mouths, any do you know any type of lying, any type of of, of conniving uh, uh, speech. So now we, the smog starts talking again. He says, what's the Navi Tzfanya telling us? Because one day God will come to redeem us. There's no doubt. It's going to happen. What are the nations of the world going to say? If we act with honesty and integrity, when we finally do get redeemed, what will the world at large say? Yeah, God's acting with justice. It makes sense that he wants this people. He because look, they're such an upright, honest people. And they and, and the Torah of Amos is in their mouths. But if we become known as dealing with the nations of the world in a cheating fashion, in lying, in thievery, Yomru, what will the nations of the world say when we're eventually redeemed? Look at this strange thing that God did. Who did he choose to be his beloved people? A bunch of thieves and a bunch of cheats. What a chil Hashem that's going to be. So the smog says, what did I preach many times? He says, the geula is going to come. The redemption is going to come. Is it going to be a kiddush Hashem or is it going to be a chil Hashem though? That, the choice is ours. If we act as honest people, then when we're redeemed, what will the world say about us? They'll say, Hashem, it makes sense. This is such an honest people. I get it. I understand why you're drawing them close, why you're showing them such love, and why you're favoring them. I, I get it. But if we're acting like a bunch of crooks, cheats, and liars, if every time there's a scandal, it's got to be another member of the tribe, if every time something hits the news and it's another one of these Ponzi schemes, it's got to be another member of the tribe, what's the world going to say? What was going to say when that redemption happens? This is the people. This is who you want, God. Bunch of crooks. Bunch of no goodniks. This is who you're altering the course of human history for. This is what you're changing the laws of nature for. For this. For this people. What a chil Hashem that's going to be. So the smog said, if we're if we want to create the best, the the the, the most the most opportune sign. The opportune, you might say, the opportune season for the redemption, let's start acting honestly. We may be slowing down our redemption because Hashem wants to avoid a chil Hashem. And if we are not living up to who we're supposed to be and Hashem brings the redemption now, it's going to be a massive chil Hashem because the world's going to say, what kind, of, what kind of ugly people is this that God wants to redeem? We might be slowing down. We might be ma'akev the gula. We might be slowing things down. But if we can become honest people, if we become known as honest people, people of integrity, people of honesty, then when the gula happens, it's going to be a kiddush Hashem. So I, God will be more prone to make that happen. That's what the smog was saying. I thought this is absolutely fascinating. So you see here the Rabag is telling us how sensitive Klal Yisrael was to how they're being perceived by the world. And it's not just that he's got this, God forbid, this neurotic sense of looking over his shoulder. What does the world think about us? What the world thinks about us is very important, as the smog said, because the gula is going to happen. The redemption is going to happen. And what the world thinks about us, if we're honest, if we're people who are upright, if we're paradigms of integrity, then people are going to say, yeah, that makes sense. It's a kiddush Hashem. But if God forbid, that's not how we're known. When that gula happens, it can end up being a terrible chil Hashem. That goes against everything God wants to accomplish with the gula. So therefore, the choice is ours. It's in our hands. We have to be cognizant of what is it that the world thinks about us. And that should motivate us. And that should help us when we are in a challenging situation. We want to know, should I be honest? Or should I attempt to take a shortcut? Let's go with the honesty. It's always going to be better. Honesty is the best policy. With that, I want to wish everyone a good day. I want to wish everyone a wonderful Purim. It should be a joyous Purim. And just like we say in al -Anisim, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu does Nisim for our Avosena, did Nisim, did miracles for our ancestors, as we're going to commemorate very soon in Purim. May he do those miracles, may he share those miracles with Klai Yisrael, again, speedily in our day.
With that, I'm going to wish everyone a good day. 